Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Three years ago, a group of astronomers using the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii were examining the atmosphere of Venus, looking for something that many people thought was impossible. They detected the absorption of light in sub-millimeter wave bands, which was consistent with the chemical phosphine or phosphane. Now, you might have heard of this chemical, but hopefully you haven't smelled its uh, characteristic garlic-like odour because it's actually used in fumigation to kill pests, and there's lots of horror stories of people dying from this. It's a pretty simple chemical, though. It's a phosphorus atom with three hydrogen atoms around the outside. However, it's of interest to astronomers as a potential biosignature. It's a chemical which may indicate the existence of chemical processes consistent with life. Now, if we look at the Earth's atmosphere, we see mixtures of chemicals which shouldn't exist without life because they would break down over time. You might think that oxygen's a pretty good indicator, and it may be, but there's non-biological processes which might create that. But say, combine that with the observation of methane in the atmosphere, and that methane should get very quickly destroyed by the oxygen, so there must be a source of this methane, right? So anyway, similarly, phosphine should break down when exposed to ultraviolet light, either directly by photo disassociation or by interaction with uh, free radicals from, say, water that's being broken up by uh, ultraviolet. So if we're seeing it in the upper atmosphere of Venus, then it has to be being replenished. We also see phosphine in the atmosphere of gas giants and brown dwarfs, but in these cases, these are hydrogen-rich atmospheres that reach much higher temperatures and pressures. So it actually becomes energetically possible for the phosphorus in those worlds to generate phosphine deep down and then have that gas be swept up in convection currents higher into the atmosphere where it's observable. But on Venus, the pressures aren't high enough and uh, Venus is a carbon dioxide dominated atmosphere. But on Earth, the dominant source of phosphine gas is biological processes in the absence of oxygen. For example, if you've got a flooded field, the bacteria in the soil can start to generate this gas. I mean, it's not the only way it's produced. For example, we have industrial production of these chemicals, but if you think about it, industrial production of chemicals is pretty much a sign of intelligent life. As an aside, by the way, life is very much dependent on the element phosphorus, and it was actually the first element to be discovered that wasn't like known in nature since ancient times. There was a guy called Hennick Brand who was trying to make gold by boiling down huge quantities of urine. Never has science sound so glamorous. So phosphine has other advantages as our biomarker. It doesn't dissolve well in water, so it doesn't get rained out quickly. It doesn't stick to things, so it doesn't get entrained in dust grain. It remains free. Other possible biosignatures might be produced in enough quantities that never reach the upper atmospheres of planets. And finally, champions of phosphine as an exobiology marker have shown that the spectral features can easily be distinguished from other candidate molecules. Now, I heard about this last year when it was suggested that this were, would be observable in some exoplanets transiting their parent stars, assuming you could, say, borrow the James Webb telescope when it was launched for a week or so. But anyway, knowing all this, the team had began looking for the signature of phosphine using the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in June 2017. That's three years ago. I visited back then, by the way, just coincidentally. So the JCMT works in the millimeter range of the spectrum. This is in the sort of region between radio waves and infrared. The specific wavelength they're looking at is a feature at 1.126 millimeters. So Let's be clear, the team specifically went looking for this and they found it three years ago. But they didn't just run out and publish this paper. Instead, they analysed it more. They wanted to make sure this was correct. Their model for phosphine chemistry was fleshed out in the Venusian atmosphere. And in 2019, they got even more data from the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And not only was it great to have more data, but the ALMA actually has higher resolution, so they were able to get differentiation between the poles and the equator. So... After years of analysis, they finally published and they show a clear detection of phosphine in the upper atmosphere of Venus. It's not much, it's about 20 parts per billion. They've also shown that the signature is weaker at the poles and stronger in the mid-latitudes. Now, 
The other part of this work is modelling all of the known chemical processes which could create phosphine and then comparing the quantities generated. So they believe that they've ruled out simple thermodynamic driven processes in the you know, dense atmosphere of Venus. They've investigated production driven by lightning, by volcanoes, tectonic events, delivery by meteorites, and all of these fall short of the amounts they're seeing. So having spent all this effort uh, trying to see what else it could be and showing that it couldn't work that way, it now means the case for this being a potential biological process is stronger. It doesn't mean it's the only thing. There could be some unknown process they haven't figured out. It's not proof. And while it would be amazing if this were true, I think the world will expect stronger evidence. And, you know, we'll probably see more analysis in the next few years. In particular, it would be really good to look for the phosphine spectra in different wavelengths, uh, in the, you know, further into the infrared, for example. And if that then holds up, spacecraft might develop instrumentation to specifically, say, sample the atmosphere, maybe look for evidence in there. But I hear you ask, isn't the surface of Venus one of the places in the solar system most hostile to life as we know it? Well, yes. If you or I were to step out onto the surface of Venus, we would be broiled, crushed, asphyxiated, and corroded at the same time. But higher up the atmosphere, the pressures and temperatures get much more amenable to human life. Although, of course, you would still asphyxiate because the atmosphere doesn't have any oxygen. Proponents of life on Venus suggest that it could live in the atmosphere, perhaps as dedicated spores floating on the air currents until they find a water droplet where they could live for a while before the water droplet sank too low into the atmosphere and evaporated. Billions of years ago, Venus likely had an ocean and a less dense atmosphere, but that water dried up and the hydrogen escaped into space, meaning that there was nothing to stop the carbon dioxide driving the greenhouse effect to extremes. So maybe something evolved during that window of opportunity and then adapted to live in the skies. Alternatively, we know that impacts on Earth can throw biological material into space and that could find its way to other planets. So maybe life from Earth made it to Venus and somehow adapted. But you know what? It's equally likely that if Venus had life, that it could have been thrown into space and made it way to Earth and seed life here. You know, panspermia is an interesting thing, but I, I don't think we're going to get any uh, clues as to that. But ultimately, this detection of phosphine in Venus is good science. The, it's a strong argument that we should perhaps spend a bit more time and effort looking at Venus with spacecraft. NASA has two Venus mission proposals as finalists in the current discovery program. Maybe one will end up going and taking us closer to an answer as to the possibility of life on Venus. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.